Hello, and welcome to Screaming in the Cloud with your host, Chief Cloud Economist at the Duckbill Group, Corey Quinn. This weekly show features conversations with people doing interesting work in the world of cloud, thoughtful commentary on the state of the technical world, and ridiculous titles for which Corey refuses to apologize. This is Screaming in the Cloud. This video is sponsored by Teleport. Supply chain attacks and other application exploits are growing faster than ever. Why is that? Well, here's an industry secret for you. Everyone is secretly really bad at their jobs a disturbing proportion of the time. A big, considerably more fixable reason is because vulnerable CI CD systems, service accounts, and microservices all don't have an identity. No identity means no authentication and authorization when these services are used, which in turn tends to serve to maximize the blast radius of an attack. And that's why Teleport created Machine ID. Machine ID delivers identity-based access and audit for infrastructure resources like servers and databases, CI CD automation, service accounts, and custom code and applications such as microservices. By consolidating identity-based credentials for engineers and the applications they write, Teleport closes the identity loophole that enables compromised infrastructure and code to be used in cyber attacks. People will still suck at our jobs, but Machine ID helps our security posture suck significantly less. Smash the link to learn more, along with the like and subscribe buttons while you're poking around on there. Welcome to Screaming in the Cloud. I'm Corey Quinn. We talk a lot about how people go about getting into this ridiculous industry of ours. And I've talked a little bit about how I go about finding interesting and varied guests to show up and help me indulge my ongoing love affair on this show with the sound of my own voice. Today, we're going to be able to address both of those because today I'm speaking to Linda Haviv, who, as of this recording, has accepted a job as a developer advocate at AWS but has not started. Linda, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Corey. Happy to be here. So you and I have been talking for a while, and there's been a lot of interesting things I've learned along the way. You were one of the first people I encountered when I joined the TikToks, as all the kids do these days, and was trying to figure out, is there a community of folks who use AWS, which really boils down to, so where are these people that are sad all the time? Well, it turns out they're on TikTok, so there we go. We found, we found my people. And that was great. And we started talking and it turns out that we were both in the AWS Community Builder Program and we've developed a bit of a rapport. We talk about different things and, and then I guess weird stuff started happening in the context of you were, you're doing very well at building an audience for yourself on TikTok. I tried it and it was, my sense of humor sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. I've had challenges in finding any reasonable way to monetize it because a 30 second video doesn't really give nuance for a full ad read, for example. And you've been looking at it from the perspective of a content creator looking to build the audience slash platform as step one, and then eh, step two, you'll sort of figure out aspects of monetization later, which honestly is a way easier way to do it in hindsight, but you know, the things that we learn. <laughs> it, now that you're going to AWS, are you first, are you planning to still be on the TikToks and whatnot? Absolutely. So I really look at TikTok as a funnel. I don't think it's the main place you're going to get that deep dive content, but I think it's a great way, especially for things that excite you or, or get you into understanding it, especially beginner type audience. I think there's a lot of untapped market of people looking to get into tech or technologists that aren't in the cloud. I mean, even when I worked, I worked as a web developer and then kind of learned more about the cloud end. I started out as a front end developer and shifted into like SRE and its infrastructure. So um, even for people within tech, you could have a huge tech community on which there is on TikTok, or like a younger community, but not all of them really understand the cloud necessarily depending on their fu job function. So I think it's a great way to kind of expose people to that. For me, my exposure came from community. I met somebody at a meetup um, who was working in cloud and it wasn't even on the job that I really started getting into cloud because many times in corporations, you might be working in a specific team and you're not really encountering other ends. And it seems kind of like a mystery. All that shouldn't seem like magic. Many times when you're doing certain job functions, especially the DevOps end, could end up feeling like magic. So <laughs> um, for the good and the bad. Uh, so sometimes if you're not working on that end, you really 
sometimes take it for granted. Um, and so for me, I actually, meetups were the way I got exposed to that end. And then I brought it back into my work and shifted internally and did certifications and started even lunch and learns uh, where I work to get more people uh, in their learning journey together within the company and, you know, help us as we're migrating to the cloud, as we're building on the cloud, which of course we have many more roles, roles down the road. I, I did it for a few years and saw the shift. Um, but I, I worked in a media company for many years and now I'm shifting to data bus. And so, um, I've seen that happen on different ends. Um, not, oh, I wasn't the one doing the migration because I was on the other end at that time. But now I, I, for the last two years, I was working on the infrastructure end. And so it's really fascinating. And many people actually, till now, I feel like they'll work on maybe the web development end or mobile end, don't always know as much about the content. So I think it's a great way to funnel things in a quick manner. I think also society is getting used to short videos and our attention span is very low. Um, and I think no argument here. Spending so much, yeah, we're spending so much time on these platforms. We might as well, uh, you know, learn something. Um, and I think it depends what content. Some things works well, some things doesn't. As as anything, content creation, you kind of have to do trial and error. Um, but I do find the audience to be a bit different on TikTok versus Twitter versus Instagram versus YouTube, which is interesting how it's going to play it on YouTube too, which is a whole other conversation. It's odd to me watching your path. It's almost the exact opposite of mine, where I started off on the back end grumpy sysadmin world. And oh, why would I ever need to learn JavaScript? No, well, genius, because as the world progresses, guess what? That's right. The entire world becomes JavaScript. Welcome. And it took me a long time to come around to that. You started with the front end world and then basically approached it from the exact opposite end. Let's be clear back in my day, mine was the common path. These days, yours is very much the common path. Yeah. I also want to highlight that all of those transitions and careers that you spoke about, you were at the same company for nine years, which in tech is closer to 30. So I have to ask, what was it that inspired you to, after nine years, to decide, I'm going to go work somewhere else, but not just anywhere. I'm going to AWS. Because normally people become yeah. almost institutionalized lifers past a certain point. Like, oh, you'll, <laughs> you'll be there till you retire or die. Whereas seeing significant career change after that long in one place, even if you've moved around internally and experienced a lot of different roles, is not common at all. What, what sparked that? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's such a good question. I always think about that too, especially as I was reflecting, because I'm, you know, in the midst of this transition and I've done a lot of reflecting in the last two weeks um, <laughs> or more. But I think the main thing for me is I always, wherever I was in this kind of something that I, I'm very proactive when it comes to trying to transition. I think um, even when I was, right, I held many roles in the same company. I used to work in TV production and actually left for three months to go to a coding bootcamp and then came back on the other end. But I understood the product in a different way. So for that time period, it was really interesting to work on the other end. Um, but, you know, as I kind of, every time I wanted to progress further, um, I always made a move that was actually new and put me in an uncomfortable place, even within the same company. Um, and at, at the point now that I'm at in my career, I felt like this next step really needs to be, you know, in, in at AWS because it felt like the natural progression for me. I worked alongside on the client end with AWS and have seen so many projects uh, uh, come through and how, how much our own work workloads have changed. And it's just been an incredible um, journey also dealing with the accounts team on that end. I've worked alongside them. So for me, it was kind of a natural progression. I was very passionate about cloud computing AWS. And I kind of wanted to take it to that next place. And I felt like also dealing with the community as part of my job is a dream part to me because I was always doing that on the side on social media. So um, it wasn't part of my day to day job. I was working as an SRE and an infrastructure engineer. So I didn't get to do that as part of my day to day. I was making videos at 2 a.m. and, you know, kind of trying to like deal, uh, you know, interact with the community like that. And I think um, I come from a performing background, a people background. I was singing since I was four years old. I always go to, I was a wedding singer. So I go into a room and I, I love making people happy or giving value. And I think like education has a huge part of that. And in a way, like you making that people's content attention and, you can't teach yeah. them a damn thing. Right. Exactly. So it's kind of a mix of everything. It's like that performance, the love of learning, you know, between you and I, like I, I wanted to be a lawyer before I thought I was going to, before I went into tech, I thought I was going to be a lawyer purely because I love the concept of going to law school. I never, took time to think about the law part, like being the lawyer part, I always thought, oh, school, 
I'm a student at heart. I always call myself a professional student because I really think that's part of what you need to be in this world, in this, in this tech industry. And um, I think for me, that's what keeps my fire going. I just, I love to experiment, to learn, to build. And there's something very fulfilling about building products. If you take a step back, like you're kind of, you know, for me, that, that, that part, every time I look back at that, that always is what kind of keeps me going. When I was doing front end, it felt a lot more like I was doing smaller things than when I was doing infrastructure. So I felt like that was another reason why I shifted. Um, I loved doing the front end, but I felt like if I was spending two days on an internet explorer uh, bug and it just drove me, <laughs> it just made me, made it feel unfulfilling versus spending two days on, you know, trying to understand why, you know, something doesn't run on the infrastructure end or like, there's, you know, it's, it's failing blindly, you know, stuff like that. Like, I don't know, for me, that felt more fulfilling because the, the problem was more macro, but I think I needed both. I, I have a love for both, but I definitely prefer the, uh, the back end and then search end. So, <laughs> well, I'm saying Is that this now. Might but... <laughs> be a, a weakness on my part where, where I'm basically projecting onto others. And this is, I might be completely wrong on this, but I tend to take a bit of a bifurcated view of community. I mean, community is part of the reason that I know the things I know and how I got to this place that I am. So use that as a cautionary tale if you want. But I, when I talk to someone like you at this moment, where you're in the community, I'm in the community, and I'm talking to you about a problem I'm having, and we're working on ways to potentially solve that or how to think about that, I view us as basically commiserating on these things. Whereas yeah. as soon as you start on day one, and yes, it's always day one, at AWS, and this becomes your day job, and you work there, on some level, for me, there's like a, a bit shift that happens, and a switch gets flipped in my head where, oh, yep. you actually work at this company. That means you're the problem. And I'm not saying that in a way <laughs> of, of being antagonistic. Please, if you're watching or listening to this, do not antagonize the developer advocates. They have a very hard job understanding all this so they can explain it to the rest of us. But how do you wind up planning to navigate, or I guess your views yeah. on I guess, handling the shift between one of the customers like the rest of us to, as I say, part of the problem, for lack of a better term. <laughs> or like work because you kind of get the fear. I love this question. And it's something I've been pondering a lot on because I think the messaging will need to be a little different coming from in the sense of there needs to be just in anything, you have to kind of create trust. And to create trust, you have to be vulnerable and authentic. And I think I, for example, utilize a lot of things outside of just the AWS cloud topic to do that now, even when I, you know, kind of building it without saying where I work or anything like that, going into this role and it being my job, it's going to be a different kind of challenge as far as that messaging. But I think it still holds true that that part that just developing trust and authenticity, I might have to do more of that. You know, I might have to really share more of that part, share other things to really, because it's more like people come, it's not, it doesn't matter how, much sometimes, how many times you explain it, many times they will see your title and they will judge you for it and they don't know what happened before. Every TikTok, for example, you have to act like it's a new person watching. There is no series, you know, like, yes, there's a series, but like sometimes you can make that, but it's not really the way TikTok functions or, or short form video functions. So you kind of have to think this is my first time. It works time really terribly when you try and break it out that yeah. way on TikTok. Yeah. Right. right. Here's yeah. parts like you, you see, I think here's part 17 of my 80 TikTok video saga. Okay. And it's, could you just turn this into a blog post or put this on YouTube or something? I, I don't have four hours to spend learning how all this stuff works in your world. Yeah. And you know, I think repeating certain things too is really important. So they say you have to repeat something eight times for people to see it or something like that. It, it, I learned that in media. In a row the or, is, yeah. In a row. <laughs> well, I mean, it, the truth is that when when you kind of like do a TikTok, maybe like there's something you could also say or clarify because I think there's going to be, and, and I'm going to have, there's going to be a lot of trial and error for me. I don't know if I have the answers, but I do, my plan is going into it very much testing that kind of introduction or like clarifying what that role is. Because the truth is, the role is advocating on behalf of the community and really helping that community. So um, making sure that you don't have to say it as far as far as the definition, maybe, but like making sure that comes across when you create a video. And I think that's going to be really important for me and more important than than prior even doing con creating content uh, going forward. Um, so I think that's one thing that I definitely feel like is, is key. Um, as well as creating more raw interaction. So it depends on the platform too. Instagram, for example, is much more um, community, uh, how do I put this? 
Instagram is much more um, easy to navigate as far as reaching the same community because you have something like called Instagram stories, right? So on Instagram stories, you're, you're bringing those stories mostly to the same people that follow you. You're able to build that trust through those stories. On TikTok, they just release stories. I haven't really tried them much and I don't play out, play with it a lot, but I think that's something I will utilize because that goes to the people that already follow you, meaning they have seen a piece of content. So I think addressing it differently and knowing where that, who's watching what and trying to kind of put yourself in their shoes when you're trying to, you know, teach something is important for, for you to have that trust with them. And I think key to everything, being raw and authentic. I think people see through that. Um, I would hope they do. And I think, uh, <laughs> and I think that's what I'm going to be trying, you know, to do. I'm just going to be really myself and real and try to help people. And I hope that comes through because that's, uh, I'm passionate about getting more people into the cloud and, and getting them educated. And I feel like it's, it's something that could also allow you to build anything just from your, just from anywhere on your computer brings people together. The world's getting smaller, really. And, um, just, uh, being able to also meet people through that and, and, there's just a way to also change your life and people really could change their life. I changed my life. I think going into tech and I'm in the United States and I, you know, in, I'm in New York, you know, and, uh, but I feel like so many people in, in the States and outside of the States, you know, all over the world, you know, have access to this and it's powerful to be able to build something and contribute and be a part of the future of technology, which AWS is. I, I feel like in three um, years or whenever it is that you leave AWS in the far future, we're going to basically pull this video up and MST3K it together. It's like, remember how naive you were talking about these things? TikTok is firmly convinced, based upon what it shows me, that I am apparently a lesbian, which, okay, fine, awesome, whatever. I'm also, it keeps showing me ads for ADHD stuff. And it was like, wow, like, how did it know that? Followed by, oh, right, I'm on TikTok, never mind. And I will say at one point, it recommended someone to me who, looking at the profile picture, uh, she's my nanny. And it's, I, I have a strong policy of not, you know, stalking my household employees on social media. We are not Facebook friends. We are not in a, a bunch of different areas. Like, how on earth would they have figured this out? I'm, I'm filling the cork board with conspiracy and twine, followed by, wait a minute, we probably both connect from the Wi-Fi, the same Wi-Fi network, which looks like the same IP address, and it probably doesn't require a giant data science team to put two and two together on those things. So it was great. I was all set to do the tinfoil hat conspiracy, but no, no, that's just very basic correlation 101. And also, this is why I don't enable contacts on TikTok. You know how it says, oh, connect your contacts. Oh, I never do that. Like, hey, can we look at your contacts? Never. No. Can we never. look at all of your photos? Absolutely not. It, can we track you <laughs> no. across apps? Why would anyone say yes to this? You're going to do it anyway, but I'll say no. Yeah. Giving it the least privilege. <laughs> Definitely oh, not. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I think. But I also, when looks, I'm looking at the monetization problem is always a challenge on things like this too, because yeah. when I'm, but my guilty TikTok scrolling pleasures uh, hit, it's, it's basically late at night. I just want to see, I want something to wind down, wind down and decompress. And I'm not about ready to watch. Hey, would you like to migrate your enterprise database to this other thing? It's, no, like, there's a reason that the ads that seem to be everywhere and doing well are aimed at the mass market. They're generally impulse buys. Like, hey, do you want to right. set that thing over there on fire, but you're not close enough to get the job done? Buy this flamethrower today. Done. Yeah. And great. Like, that is something everyone can enjoy. But these nuanced database products I, I and anything else that's B2B SaaS style stuff, it feels like it's a very tough sell. And no one has yeah. quite cracked that nut yet. Yeah, and I think the key there, this is I'm, I'm guessing and based on like what I want to try out a lot is the hook and the way you're presenting it has to be very product focused in the sense that it needs to be very relatable. Even if you don't know anything about tech, you need to be like, for example, um, there was there in the architecture um, page on AWS, there's a video about the Emirates going to uh, Mars mission. Space is a very interesting topic, right? I think a hook like, do you want to see how like how this is built? Like it's all like freely available to see exactly how this was built. Like it might in the in the right wording, of course, it might be interesting to someone who's looking for fun fact style content. Now. Is it really addressing the people that are building every day? Not really always. Depends who's on there and the mass market there. And But I feel like going on the product and the things that are mass market and then working backwards to the tech part of it, even if they learn something and then want to learn more, 
that's really where I see TikTok. I don't, I don't think every platform would be maybe like this, but that's where I see getting people kind of inviting them in to learn more, but making it cool and fun. It's very important that it feels cool and fun. <laughs> so, because you're right, you're scrolling at 2 a.m. Who wants to start seeing that? Did you, you know, like, it's all about how you teach. The content is there. The content has, you know, that that's my thing. It's like the content is there. You don't need to, it, it's, yes, there's the part where things are always evolving and you need to keep track of that. It's a whole nother type of thing, which you do very well, right? And then there's the part where like the content that already exists, which part is evergreen, meaning which part is like something that could be re also is not timely as far as update, for example, well, architected framework. Yes, it evolves all the time. You always have new pillars, but the guide, the story, that is an evergreen in some sense, because that guide isn't, you know, that whole concept isn't going anywhere. So, you know, why right. how to turn on two factor that? authentication for your AWS account. Right. That's evergreen. That's the sort of thing that, right. and this is the problem I think AWS has had for a long time, where they're talking about new features, new enhancements, new releases, but you look at what people are actually doing. And so much of it is just the same stuff again and again, because right. yeah, that is how most of the cloud works. It turns out that three yep. quarters of companies' production infrastructures tends to run on EC2 more frequently than it tends to run on IoT green grass. Or imagine that. So there's this, this <laughs> idea of, continuing to focus on these things. Now, one of my predictions is that you're going to have a lot of fun with this and at some level, it's going to really work for you and others, it's going to be hilariously, um, well, its shortcomings might be predictable. Like I can just picture now you're at reInvent, you do have a breakout talk and terrific. And you've successfully gotten your talk down to one minute. And then you're sitting there with the <laughs> remainder of meaning 59, like, oh, right. Yeah, it turns out not everything is short form. Are you predicting any yep. problems going from short form to long form in those instances? I think it needs to go hand in hand, to be honest. I think when you're creating any short form content, you have studied, you know, making something short is actually sometimes in some ways, right, harder because you, you really have to make sure, especially in a technical standpoint, leaving things out is sometimes give, leaves like a blind spot. And so making sure you're kind of, Whatever you're educating, kind of need to be clear. Here's where you learn more. Here's whatever. Here's how I'm going to answer this next question for you. Go here. Now, in a longer form content, you would cover all that. So there's always that longevity. I think even when I write a script, and there's many scripts that I'm still, I've, I've had many ideas. Till now, I've been doing this till 2 a.m. So of course, there's many that didn't, you know, get released. But those are the things that are more time consuming to create because you're taking something that's an hour long and trying to make sure you're pulling out the things that are most um, that are, that are hook style that invite people in that are accurate. Okay. That really give you, uh, explain to you clearly where the blind spots that I'm not explaining on this video are. So X, Y, Z here is like the, the high level, but by the way, there's like this and this and this. Um, and in a long form, you kind of have to know the long form version of it to make the short form in some, in some ways, depending on what you're doing, because you're funneling them to somewhere. That's my thing. This I don't is think the curse of Twitter thoughts. on some level. It's, it's well, you uh -huh. forgot about this corner case. Yeah, I had 280 characters to get into. Like the whole point of short form content, which I do consider Twitter to be, is a glimpse and a hook and get people interested enough to go somewhere and learn more. For something like AWS, this makes a lot of sense. When you uh, talk, when you highlight a right. capability or something interesting, it's something relevant. Whereas on the other side of it, where it's this, oh, great, and now here's an 8,000 word blog post and how I did this thing. Yeah, I'm going to get relatively uh, fewer uh, amounts of traffic through that giant thing. But the people who are there are going to be freaking invested because that's going to be a exactly. slog. And now my eight hour video on how exactly I built this thing with TypeScript. Badly, as it turns exactly. out, because I'm a bad programmer. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> I, I wish you luck yeah. in the new gig. And I also want to thank you for taking time out of your day to speak with me about how you got to this point. And we're all very eager to see where you go from here. Thank you so much, Corey, for having me. Uh, I'm a huge fan. I love your content. Um, I'm an avid reader of your newsletter. And I am looking forward to very much being in touch and on the, on the Twitterverse and beyond. So <laughs> if people want to learn more about what you're up to and other assorted nonsense, where's the best place they can go to find you? So the best place they could go is lindaviva.com. I have all my different social handles listed on there as well as a little bit about me and I hope to connect with you. So definitely uh, go to lindaviva.com. And that link will, of course, be in the show notes. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Corey. Have a wonderful rest of the day.
Linda Haviv, AWS developer advocate, very soon now anyway. I'm cloud economist Corey Quinn, and this is Screaming in the Cloud. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. Whereas if you've hated this podcast, please leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. Smash the like and subscribe buttons. And of course, leave an angry comment that you have broken down into 40 serialized TikTok videos. 